the tripartite division only began to be proposed by modern Egyptologists in the late 19th century, and the terms they introduced, initially Reich or Empire, later Kingdom, were explicitly modeled on European nation states. German, particularly Prussian scholars, played a leading role here. Their tendency to perceive ancient Egypt's past as a series of cyclical alternations between unity and disintegration clearly echoes the political concerns of Bismarck's Germany, where an authoritarian government was trying to assemble a unified nation-state from an endless variety of tiny statelets. After the First World War, as Europe's own regime of old monarchies was coming apart, prominent Egyptologists such as Adolf Ehrman granted the intermediate periods their own place in history, drawing comparisons between the end of the Old Kingdom and the Bolshevik Revolution of their own time. With hindsight, it's easy to see just how much these chronological schemes reflect their author's political concerns, or even, perhaps, a tendency, when casting their minds back in time, to imagine themselves either as part of the ruling elite or as having roles somewhat analogous to ones they had in their own societies. The Egyptian or Maya equivalents of museum curators, professors, and middle-range functionaries. But why, then, have these schemes become effectively canonical? Consider the Middle Kingdom, 2055 to 1650 BC, represented in standard histories as a time when Egypt moved from the supposed chaos of the first intermediate period into a renewed phase of strong and stable government, bringing with it an artistic and literary renaissance. Even if we set aside the question of just how chaotic the intermediate period really was, we'll get to that soon, the Middle Kingdom could equally well be represented as a period of violent disputes over royal succession, crippling taxation, state-sponsored suppression of ethnic minorities, and the growth of forced labor to support royal mining expeditions and construction projects, not to mention the brutal plundering of Egypt's southern neighbors for slaves and gold. However much future Egyptologists would come to appreciate them, the elegance of the Middle Kingdom literature like the story of Sinuhe and the proliferation of Osiris cults likely offered little solace to the thousands of military conscripts, forced laborers, and persecuted minorities of the time, many of whose grandparents were living quite peaceful lives in the preceding Dark Ages. What is true of time, incidentally, is also true of space. For the last 5,000 years of human history, that is roughly the span of time we will be moving around in over the course of this chapter, our conventional vision of world history is a checkerboard of cities, empires, and kingdoms. But in fact, for most of this period, these were exceptional islands of political hierarchy, surrounded by much larger territories whose inhabitants, if visible at all to historians' eyes, are variously described as tribal confederacies, amphictyonies, or, if you're an anthropologist, segmentary societies, that is, people who systematically avoided fixed overarching systems of authority. We know a bit about how such societies worked in parts of Africa, North America, Central or Southeast Asia, and other regions where such loose and flexible political associations existed into recent times, but we know frustratingly little of how they operated in periods when these were by far the world's most common forms of government. A truly radical account, perhaps, would retell human history from the perspective of the times and places in between. In that sense, this chapter is not truly radical. For the most part, we are telling the same old story, but we are at least trying to see what happens when we drop the teleological habit of thought which makes us scour the ancient world for embryonic versions of our modern nation-states. We are considering instead the possibility that, when looking at those times and places usually taken to mark the birth of the state, we may in fact be seeing how very different kinds of power crystallize 
each with its own peculiar mix of violence, knowledge and charisma, our three elementary forms of domination. One way to test the value of a new approach is to see if it helps us explain what had previously seemed anomalous cases, that is, ancient polities which undeniably mobilized and organized enormous numbers of people, but which don't seem to fit any of the usual definitions of a state. Certainly there are plenty of these. Let's start with the Olmec, generally seen as the first great Mesoamerican civilization. On politics as sport, the Olmec case. 